Well, hello everybody. My name is John Johnson from NSF. I'm Vice President of our Pharma Biotech Division. And you've got the pleasure of my company and I've got the pleasure of your company for the next 30 minutes to give a discussion about how to use behavioral GMP to ensure your facility is GMP inspection ready at all times. Now, right at the very start of this webinar, I want to uh, make it clear that uh, we see lots and lots of companies that have incredibly detailed and elegant policies, procedures, instructions, and record sheets, but they just don't achieve the level of GMP compliance that's required by the internationally recognized regulatory bodies. And we often see that uh, the reason for this is an over complexity in their policies and procedures and record sheets, and also a lack of attention to the creation of a culture and a process that provides a behavior, a behavior that ensures GMP. And I'm going to give you some pointers on how to create those perfect behaviors in your quality management system. So I'm sure many of you uh, know NSF already. We are a leading GMP consultancy that deal in um, specialist training, auditing, and consultancy. Myself and my team uh, work on a number of transformational projects at uh, pharmaceutical companies around the world that focus on delivering change, delivering change for the better that is durable, long-term, and leaves behind the scaffolding education, training, and expertise of the local subject matter experts to enable that level of compliance to uh, be maintained for the long term. And we work a across a number of different spheres, as you can see on slide two. Slide three gives some basic information about myself. Um, obviously, I've worked in uh, industry now for the best part of 33 years um, across both operational and uh, corporate quality roles, working with companies to ensure uh, effective new product introductions, uh, regulatory inspections, uh, and, and the successful outcomes from those inspections. And also when things go wrong, things go awry, how do you then uh, return the company to uh, the best of health in terms of GMP uh, compliance? And uh, my experience has led me to um, NSF, where I perform a number of different projects and programs for uh, trusted partners and clients. So what we're going to be talking about at this webinar is what, what does perpetual GMP inspection readiness actually mean? How do you achieve it? And what questions should you be asking of yourself, your team, and your quality system and how might you use our business improvement through education toolkit to make sure you're asking the right questions, receiving answers that make sense, and answers that you can actually put to practical use at shop floor level to provide the level of GMP compliance that you're looking for. And a key message right from the very start of this webinar is, is that SEEC makes a huge difference in how you perform GMP inspection readiness programs. And SEEC is all around simplification of communication, simplification of instructions and messages, engaging the team um, at all levels in a way that is meaningful and practical to them, making sure the team is educated in the know-how and the know-why of the particular role they play, and gaining their whole selves, their whole commitment to making sure the outcome of your inspection is what you hoped it would be. And of course, I'm going to talk about the basic toolkit for inspection preparation that gives a very nice aid memoir of what you would need to put in place to be sure that uh, next regulatory inspection is stress-free and gives you the uh, result that you desire. Now, ultimately, your work your uh, commitment and your daily uh, tasks is all about making sure that you get the level of GMP compliance you're looking for. And you put in an awful lot of research, commitment, expense, discussions, meetings, and plannings to actually get what you're looking for. 
And this photograph means quite a lot to me because I went on a holiday to British Columbia uh, last December. And in order to be sure that I'd get the uh, holiday experience I was looking for and to catch some of these amazing fish that I was searching for, I did five years of research. I read four books, 25 magazines. I, I became very familiar with two maps. I spent two years on internet message boards. I tied 80 flies, and I approached uh, a totally modified um, uh, technique and tackle and clothing to be sure that I was successful. And I guess one of the key messages from this slide is that what we do every day, the way we prepare, the way we execute our uh, tasks is actually contributing to the end game each and every day. So in effect, you're doing preparation for your next inspection each and every day. And that's a very good message to share with your colleagues, that it doesn't matter at what level they're working at, either strategic or tactical, what they're doing contributes to that inspection, be it every uh, quarter, from different regulatory bodies every year or every two years, what you do every day contributes to the final outcome. And if you want a spectacular outcome, you have to do a spectacular amount of preparation and research. So that's the key message there. So what happens during the inspection is really a result of what your team does every day, every hour, and for every decision they make. And being sure that they have an effective and scientific rationale for those decisions that's well documented, well thought through, and data driven will provide you with the confidence that you're going to get the inspection outcome that you're looking for. So it really depends on how you define and how you perform in some key areas. Of course, you need to have the right vision. You need to know what's important to your firm and what it wants to achieve for the long term. You really need to understand what the mission is. You know, where are you going? What is the journey you're on? What types of products are you working with? And what are going to be the key milestones in that journey? Of course, understanding your values and projecting those to your team, having your team work to those values and make decisions against the company values um, is crucial. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's written or verbal communication, the way you strategize your communication, the way you deliver it, the way you maintain a, a consistent and believable communication really adds uh, weight to your um, project and credibility and authenticity to the way you engage with your staff. And of course, if you have staff that are disengaged, that don't understand where you're going or why you're going there, or why it's important, you should never be surprised when they, you don't get the best from them. So taking the time to communicate with people, engaging their whole selves is critical to this process. Needless to say, and of course you would expect me to say this, and I would be wrong to miss it out, and I'm going to emphasize it time and again, your inspection outcome is going to depend wholly on the definition and performance of your pharmaceutical quality system to ICH, Q10, and whatever regulatory inspection expectations you have uh, locally. Of course, your pharma quality system should be proactive. It should be lively, and it should actually look to identify potential crises and reduce the severity, occurrence, and improve the detectability of future crises as much as possible. So you need to surround yourself with proactive quality systems and also proactive people. Of course, people thrive best when they're working in a learning environment. You want people to be able to learn from the stresses and strains of, of life and work. You want them to learn from the out-of-specification results, the out-of-trend out of, um, results, the deviations and the change controls. And you want them to be able to learn in a safe environment where blame is not a feature. You may well hold um, the processes to account. You may hold individuals to account. But it's the process that delivers the right results. And making sure people understand the process and own the process is crucial to making sure that you get the right outcome. And of course, ultimately, this uh, webinar is all about how to influence those organizational behaviors 
that really make a difference to your uh, inspection program. Needless to say, of course, all of this starts with you. You as an individual, you as a leader, as an opinion former, and somebody who other people in your organization look to as an ambassador and also as an exemplar, exemplar of the overall process. So, if we were to look at inspection readiness, what's what might success actually look like? And I've tried to make a list here of some of the examples of how people measure success. Fundamentally, you want to get through this process and this interaction with your regulatory body in a way that means that no special measures were needed ahead of that event. That actually you have perpetual inspection readiness without having to change direction or change tack at all. You want to be sure that the outcome has no critical, major, or systemic deficiencies or surprises that you had not already identified. Many companies might say that they're happy to put in place a tactical kappa, providing that kappa doesn't take um, any longer than three months to uh, put in place and to complete and to verify effectiveness, and that no additional headcount, resources, CAPEX would be needed to complete that CAPA. Fundamentally, of course, every time you're inspected by a regulatory body, you want to wring every piece of value from that inspection. You want to understand every indicator, every piece of information, uh, every perspective, so that you as a group can learn and improve for the next event. So that ultimately, each deficiency is using, used as a learning event that you can share with the wider team and you can invent new ways of preventing recurrence of deviations and deficiencies. So it's really important that everybody realizes that what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and the way they document it is actually hugely instrumental in that final outcome of your inspection. So moving on to uh, slide eight, um, the key message here is all about preparation and training. So when I had my uh, holiday in uh, British Columbia in December, well, we realized from Google, um, Google Maps and Google Earth that the logging road that was alongside the river had been very badly damaged by some um, severe floods and snowfalls. And that uh, landslip had clogged up the road and we weren't able to drive our truck up to where we wanted to fish. We realized that about six to eight weeks before the uh, holiday, so we realized that we were going to have to walk something like 10 mile round trip in snow, dragging a raft to get to where we wanted to fish. Now there was no way I was capable of doing that unless I started going to the gym, losing a bit of weight, getting a little bit fitter, because I, need, I knew I needed to keep up with these two characters um, in pulling the raft, pulling my weight, pulling my fishing tackle, up to where I wanted to fish. So the key message here is that preparation and foresight is everything. And when you've done the preparation, you need to do something with it. You need to train or you need to prepare or you need to assemble the tools and people around you to make sure that whatever happens, whatever changes or differences there are to your uh, journey, you can overcome them and still achieve what you want to achieve. So. For the companies that do this really well, what do these most successful companies continue to ask themselves? What are the six questions that make such a difference to this process? The first question is, of course, understanding risk. And to understand risk, you need to be constantly looking and identifying potential risks to your farm quality system. Where are the risks in your facilities? your utilities, your equipment, where are your risks in materials uh, supply, in production, in packaging and labeling, in the laboratories and across the quality system itself? Where am I benchmarking? Am I meeting the minimum requirements re expected? Am I exceeding them? Have I got some way to go before I even meet the minimum? So having that foresight of where you really are against those uh, GMP expectations is something that the best companies are continually asking themselves. The second question is, how will I ensure 
that this process of GMP inspection is successful? How do I provide a, a professional event that provides the right level of perspective and insight, um, accuracy in interpretation of our quality system? And how do I get a level of um, trust and respect from any uh, visitor, whether it's a corporate quality auditor or whether it's um, a client inspection or indeed a regulatory inspection? How do I make sure that process goes well and we give the best account of ourselves and also the most accurate and um, easily interpreted uh, account of ourselves? The third question that people ask is, of course, how do I remove complexity from what we do? We all know that simple processes work best. They have the least, um, uh, they have the least uh, probability of human error. They have the least um, risk. And that we know that complexity just serves to trip us up in the future. So how can we make our pharmaceutical quality system as straightforward and as easily interpreted as possible to try and reduce cost, improve service to our clients, and to remove and eliminate or reduce GMP risks or product and patient risks to the end user. So there's always a very critical gold thread in your GMP inspection readiness that seeks to reduce complexity from the business. The fourth area is how do I actually make sure that my team, my subject matter experts, my colleagues and my line managers all have the organizational behaviors that foster a successful future? How do we work together as a team? How do we respect each other? How do we hold each other to account for our different roles? How do we define the best practice across all of our roles so that in combination, we have a world-class team. Of course, how do we develop the expertise in that team? How do we continue to grow? Because we all know the moment we stop growing as a human being, we go into stasis and ultimately into decline. So we have to, particularly in this world where things are moving so quickly, we have to continually reinvent ourselves and reinvent our perspectives and try and look at things through different lenses. Of course, how do you then say to yourself, how can I certify our people? How can I not just train them, but verify as well the proficiency of that team for the long term so that they continue to make their best even better, essentially making your team the best version of itself? Now, over the last four to five years, NSF have worked very hard to develop a toolkit that helps find these answers. And I'm going to show you this toolkit um, on the next slide. So taking each of the six questions in turn, I'm showing below in the boxes the toolkits that we have that help answer each of those questions. So for question number one, how do I compare to CGMP expectations? We have a, a GMP scorecard that allows you to navigate very quickly, make good references to EU GMP volume four and the ICH guidelines. We're going to expand that as well to 21 CFR 210 to 211 as well in the future. We also have a very detailed scorecard that enables you to be very clear on whether your uh, quality system is meeting expectations, exceeding, or falling short of those expectations, and allows you to benchmark against similar companies of a similar nature, whether they are innovators, CMOs, uh, mostly in uh, generics or biosimilars, or are all in uh, innovators or clinical trial uh, production um, activities. So that scorecard across the quality system enables you to see where the risks are. And of course, once you know where the risks are, like a pothole in the road, you can seek to fill in that pothole or drive around it, or at least prevent you, your bicycle falling down that hole. We also have a way of doing a very detailed, systematic uh, gap analysis that also um, identifies for you very quickly what are the most appropriate CAPA. So really, Toolkit 1A and 1B are all about being sure of where the gaps are and sure about what to do next. Question number two, 
we've developed um, a very detailed two-day course on how to prepare, conduct, and follow up on any GMP inspection. We have training and a toolkit for that, and we also do both one-to-one -one and one-to-many coaching against those key tools. And I think the penultimate slide in this webinar seeks to give you a nice aid memoir um, as to what might be in that toolkit and how you might apply it. We also have a number of tools that uh, help you with reducing complexity. You know, for example, simplifying instructions, batch records, uh, SOPs and policies to try and remove recurring error, whether that error is currently classified often wrongly as human error, or whether it's classified as process deviation or um, out of specification results. So we have a number of um, tools and training and workshops that uh, enable you to understand the true causes of human error and the corresponding uh, environmental factors that may lead to it, ultimately looking to reduce the cost of uh, quality or poor quality. And we use a number of tools such as value stream mapping and swim lane diagrams to really comb through processes and enable you to remove the things that are not value adding. Because anything that is not value adding is a distraction and it's often a cause for error. We also have defined five um, items which we find as non-negotiable in each quality system. These are simple statements that define the minimum expectations for your quality system. So if you fail to achieve one of these five, you've missed a key part of the CGMP requirement. These are non-negotiables. These are the types of issues where if you don't follow these, you're going to get a cold stare from your line manager or a cold stare or more from the regulatory inspector because these are the basic requirements of the systems. And we've been able to refine those to the top five things in each part of your quality system. And that really simplifies both communication, messaging, auditing, and simplifies the policies and procedures that uh, define those systems. And we've been really successful in that uh, program over the last few years. Of course, we then uh, seek to answer the question around behaviors and mindset. How do you actually set a mindset that is incrementally getting ready for every inspection, that tries to do things right first time each and every time with flawless execution? where the people do it not just because it says so in the policy or the procedure. They don't just do that thing because they know the regulators are going to check it in six months' time. They do it because it's the right thing to do for the right reasons and that they know the consequences of getting it wrong. And I'm going to be talking a bit about that in this webinar. And then ultimately, of course, we do a number of uh, education and certification programs that enable your staff to be the best they can be, both in the science and compliance subjects that you would expect across the quality system, but also as leaders, communicators, opinion formers, and presenters. And we look not just to train people, but also to certify them in terms of their proficiency to do that job. So if I want perpetual GMP compliance, what must I avoid doing? What must I stop doing? And this is often a tricky thing to consider. You know, it's very easy to talk about what you should do, but what shouldn't you do? And here's the top seven. The first thing is that ultimately, if you just focus on the end game and not on the process or the behaviors, you won't get to where you want to get to. If you just focus on a number, i.e., I want to reduce the number of deviations from 100 per month, to 10 per month, and you don't focus on the process and the people interaction behind it, I can guarantee you won't achieve that. You also won't achieve it if you just make large podium statements, that you have your CEO tell everybody what's going to happen without the detail and the process and the thinking behind it. It's so important not to start big. It's important to start at a small local level and to improve things from the bottom up, not necessarily always from the top down. You also want to try and look at how to um, stop a behavior 
But actually, it's very difficult to stop a bad habit, isn't it? If you're a smoker or you eat unhealthily or you're a binge drinker or you're somebody who likes to watch five hours of TV every evening, it's very difficult once you get in that habit to stop that behavior. So our research says it's far easier to blow that uh, habit or behavior out of the water by focusing on something different. You know, rather than sitting in front of the television for five hours, why not routinely go out on your bicycle or walk the dog or do some charity work? Do something that prevents you from just turning the TV on. And actually, all of our research and all of the research in other industries focuses on how to um, blow that old behavior out of the way by focusing on a much better one. Of course, this is going to require you to think for the long term. You can't give up too soon, and you've actually got to change the environment that you work in as well. So it's really important if you've had problems with making change and changing behaviors in the past, learn from it and stop doing what didn't work in the past. So what are the common obstacles to perpetual GMP compliance? What are our enemies on this? Well, the first enemy really is when we rely on bad design. If we have a facility layout or a set of equipment that is just not capable of achieving GMP or achieving right first time or achieving a validated process, it doesn't really matter what you do. If that, if that design is that bad, you're never really going to achieve it. And equally, if your policies and procedures are 50, 60, 70 pages long, difficult to read, lots of transcriptions, lots of cross-referrals, don't be surprised when people don't follow them because you're, you're really relying on something that's badly designed. And the root of the uh, kappa that you should look at should be always around how do I improve the design of things, not just add more checks, more monitors, or more QC tests. Why not actually go to the root cause and improve the design of that policy, that facility, or that equipment? So over-reliance on policies and procedures, over-reliance on detailed instructions is always going to be a, a tough obstacle. And making sure your staff understand the consequences of getting things um, out of line is, is always important as well. As soon as I know why I should do something and the consequences to my client base or my company or my team or my uh, colleagues or even myself and my family, then uh, ultimately I've got more motivation and more trigger to actually do the right thing. So we talked about how this perpetual GMP compliance depends on SEEC. It depends on your instructions and records being designed by the users because the users will put in what's important and take out what is unimportant to them. And of course, it also depends heavily on behavioral GMP in your organization. And there's a nice quote here from Jeffrey Leiker who studied the Toyota production system and worked with Toyota for many years. And in this quote, he emphasizes the importance of individual staff behaviors in uh, developing a philosophy, a process, and an engagement that delivers things right first time for the long term. So it really is all about behaviors. So if I want to develop a process, what might it look like? How will this process be communicated? How can I make it sticky and interesting and engaging and something that people will remember? You know, you don't want your communications and your programs to be flavor of the month or something that happens uh, for a brief period of time and then is then forgotten or discarded um, or downgraded in terms of priority. And ultimately, what you're looking to do here is to influence your colleagues to actually for themselves want what you want, that they will want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Not just because you've told them that it's the right thing to do, but because they actually truly believe it in their hearts that this is the right thing to do for your clients and uh, patients. So how does this work? Well, we took a, a, a number of um, uh, months to research and study the uh, UK Nodge Unit, which was developed by um, the joint uh, Prime Ministers, Cameron and Clegg, in the UK about 10 years ago where they wanted to engage a behaviors insight team to look at how to communicate 
change in a way that people will accept and understand and do for themselves. So giving them a nudge in the right direction, but allowing them to make their own decisions on what is the right thing to do. And ultimately, you want your production processes, your laboratory methods, and your quality system to flow in a natural way that jives well with the way your company works and that people follow it quite naturally and don't seek uh, variations or uh, differences in the way things are done. And ultimately, that Behaviors Insight team, you know, the so-called nudge unit, talked a lot about how to make necessary changes east. So as easy as possible, as attractive as possible, as team or social orientated as possible, and that any communications are made at the right time when people are actively listening. So the key thing on Timely is to make sure that whenever you have a crisis or a potential crisis or some tough news, you don't let that crisis go to waste. You use it for positive reasons. You know, quite recently, I've had some of my uh, very good friends um, who are um, uh, fishermen and uh, great um, friends of mine on the riverbank who um, have been ill, and uh, unfortunately, one or two of them in the last year have, have now passed away. And I've tried to use the memory of their lives and their friendship with me to try and help me change my behaviors, to try and make my life richer, healthier, and fuller. And um, it's all about trying to use some you know, tough things in life for positive reasons and get the most out of it you possibly can. And in the same way, if your organization somewhere has an FDA 483 or a warning letter or some poor inspections, Try to use that information in a positive way for the benefit of everybody. So, ultimately, you want to try and make the right things to do easy, the wrong things to do hard, and actually use some triggers, some education, and some know why, so that people do these things quite naturally. You want to make sloppy work feel antisocial, uh, that it has an effect on people if sloppy work occurs, that people don't apply themselves correctly, it's actually noticed by others, and others are happy to call it out and try and reduce um, the recurrence of, of that sloppy work. And ultimately, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that any crisis doesn't go to waste. And there's a nice link there to a change in GMP behaviors um, a case study and white paper that's available on our resource library on the NSF website. So, We've taken this to the next level, and I think I may have shown you this on a previous webinar, where we use this equation to um, form behaviors in a team getting ready for an inspection. You want to motivate people, give them a reason for caring, give them a reason for doing something fantastic, doing something that's going to give you the outcomes you want. But it has to be for them, not just the organization or the CEO, but actually something that will help them in their day-to-day -day work. Of course, you have to give people the ability. You have to give them the access to the training, the education. You need to engage them in designing their own workplace. And you want to try and make the right outcomes easy and easily recognized, and also the wrong outcomes as uncomfortable and as, um, as, as tough as possible. Ultimately, you're looking to develop triggers and habits for doing the right thing. Because ultimately, behaviors are going to drive processes, and processes always derive the right outcomes. So um, processes we talk about a lot in terms of policies and procedures and instructions, but without the right behaviors behind them, you're not going to get the right outcome. So. What about the toolkit? Well, the toolkit for preparing and executing the inspection, you might think of almost like a communal dance. And what I have here is some uh, English uh, Morris dancers. These are folk dancers that you see often in uh, summer's evenings outside pubs and restaurants uh, around the UK. And um, they, they work together in a, in a communal dance. And actually, the toolkit is very similar to this type of uh, waltz or, or, or dance. What I mean by that, of course, ultimately, is you need some risk assessment. You need some ways of identifying risk through self-inspection, through discussion groups, 
through walking the job, and you need a way of logging those risks so that ultimately then you can evaluate those risks and do something about them in advance of them becoming a crisis. You also want to understand what your most feared questions are. What are the questions that your regulator may ask you that would put a bead of sweat on your brow or make your heart beat a bit faster or make you go flushed in the cheeks? So ultimately, if you understand what are the most complex questions and answers, what are the most feared questions, what are the areas that have given your organization most uh, difficulty, how do you then describe the situation what you did to mitigate that situation and what you plan to do in the future and what ultimately is the risk to the quality system, the product quality and patient safety. So doing proper preparation of those most feared questions is critical. Of course then you can use storyboarding techniques to uh, be able to help your subject matter experts prepare on telling that story on being able to give proper context perspective, interpretation, data, references to the CGMPs, so that your regulator can see that you've thought through all of the risks, come up with the best mitigation strategies, and that you're actively looking to reduce the severity, the frequency of that issue, and improve the detectability of that issue as well. So being able to prepare and practice your storyboarding is a great tool to use. Of course, you want to improve your communication skills. You want to be able to help people summarize, interpret, discuss, synthesize their story so that um, it's told in a way that is easily understood and interpreted by the inspector, particularly if the inspector doesn't have your local language as first language. So being able to communicate clearly and slowly and accurately is an absolutely critical skill what is worth practicing. Of course, you need to train your subject matter experts in whatever they are expert in, so that they are truly not just experts in your team, but could be considered experts within the industry or within the sphere of the industry that you're in. And that leads, of course, to staff education programs, appraising your staff, having your staff actually spend time walking the job, being on the shop floor, talking to people, observing the work, and looking to see how that work can be improved in terms of right first time and GMP compliance. There really is no substitute for walking the job. Ultimately, of course, you can then look at how you provide oversight to the quality system and then appraise that quality system and put in place any projects to improve it. Of course, then companies will design how they uh, operate the front room where the inspector is sat and uh, asks questions, how you manage the back room to supply the documentation and people and data and information that's requested. You may employ a scout to be sure that they've identified any issues ahead of any tours. You may improve the um, structure and format and uh, messaging in the opening presentation so that there is no misinterpretation from the inspector because ultimately, of course, the opening presentation and the tour is your first and only opportunity to set a first impression. And first impressions are absolutely critical. And then finally, just in the box on the top right here, are the proactive quality systems within ICHQ10 that you really need to be expert in. So looking down this list, these are the most typical quality systems that are going to be uh, verified during inspection. And you want to know for sure that they meet expectations, they are proactively seeking issues, and those issues are then being evaluated and uh, prevented for the long term. So does this work? Well, we've utilized this type of toolkit on a number of uh, projects over the last uh, four years and uh, there's just four examples there of some of the um, improvements that we've made at some of our clients facilities and fundamentally this type of approach has led to better performance better levels of gmp even less staff turnover because people feel happier and more engaged with the firm when it's performing well because ultimately nobody likes cost and overheads nobody likes waste and um, you know, people want to work in a high-performing organization. Who wouldn't? 
So um, this is a great way of doing it. But ultimately, what I want to leave you with here is that for one particular job we did, we knew that the motivation for staff on site was to actually start going home on time, that they had a, a real culture of working till 7, 8, 9, even 10 p.m. at night, week on week, month on month, and they were missing um, parents' evenings, family functions, um, they were missing their hobbies, they were becoming unhealthy, and actually the motivation for doing the right thing and improving GMP compliance was all about being able to manage that quality system within core hours and actually going home on time. And actually that was the trigger and the motivation for really making change. So try and understand what people want, what they will um, um, engage with, and uh, make those improvements deliver that for the individual. So needless to say, you know us by now. We can help in this if you want us to. You know where we are. You know our uh, website and the way to contact uh, me and my colleagues. And ultimately, we're really well placed to help you through this change curve, to help you get through to realization, letting go, fixing, and internalizing those changes as quickly as possible so that you can get back to supplying high quality product right first time, on time in full, at the right cost. And that's really what we do. So as you can see on the penultimate slide, this is our uh, program for our webinars for the remainder of 2018. I think I'm right in saying today's is the last one I'm doing this year, so um, I'm sorry about that. This is the last you'll hear from me this year unless we put some more in, but you've got some fantastic speakers and subjects there for the remainder of the year. So um, please feel free to contact us and log in for these uh, webinars as well. Needless to say, we record all of the uh, webinars. We uh, will send you the link to the webinars so you can listen to them again and, of course, share them with your colleagues as you see fit. So I'm hoping this has been of uh, use to you. Um, very best of luck in your endeavors and in your next inspection. If there's anything I can do to help, uh, any guidance or tips, techniques that I can give you, here's my contact details. Thanks for joining. This is John Johnson. NSF Health Sciences.